Howdy, folks. How, how are y'all doing? It's a beautiful Seattle day. So I've been out here for a couple weeks um, enjoying your part of the country. It really is nice out here. And I also went up to Vancouver, you know, in Canada where they have universal health care. Do you know about this? Have you guys heard about this? <laughs> it's the most incredible thing. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. I was also out at Port Angeles. Well, we'll talk about this later. I'll, uh, what I want to start by talking about, yeah, we always, we professionals always adjust the microphone. Just a little bit, just you see like a quarter of an inch. But what I want to talk about tonight is uh, Trump. Or specifically the country that voted for Trump, the country that may, just made Donald Trump president. By the way, and I still have a hard time getting my mind around that. And I'll often wake up in the morning back in Washington, the other Washington where I live, and uh, it's this beautiful sunny day and the azaleas are in bloom and, and um, you know, I have two wonderful children and I'll be so happy and then I'll remember <laughs> Trump is president <laughs> and he flies over our neighborhood in his helicopter, you know. Oh well. But let's talk about the country that just voted for him. And this is the country that I'm going to describe to you is... So I was out in Port Angeles on my vacation, and it's that, that kind of country. It's, Seattle is a very different place. Seattle is an unusual place in America, but the country that I'm talking about is different. The last few years in the country that I'm describing have been a time of brisk prosperity according to official measurements with unemployment down and the stock market up. For Americans who work for a living, however, nothing ever seems to improve. Wages don't grow. The median household income in this country is still below where it was in the year 2007. The economists have a way of measuring inequality that they call the labor share of the gross national product. And in this country, the, that measurement hit its lowest point ever. Labor's share of the gross national product hit its lowest point since they started keeping records on this in the year 2011 and then stayed there over the next couple of years. In the fall of 2014, with the stock market hitting all-time highs, a poll showed that nearly three-quarters of the American public thought that the economy was still in a recession because for them it was. Now, Folks, you know that there was a time when average Americans could be counted upon to know correctly whether things in this country were going up or things were going down. Because when America prospered, the American people prospered too. But these days, things are different. The, uh, stati another statistical way of looking at it, from the middle of the Great Depression up to the year 1980, the lower 90% of the population in this country, a group that we might refer to as the American people, that group took home 70% of the growth in America's income, okay? From the Great Depression up to 1980, 70% of the growth in the country's income. If you look at the same numbers from 1997 up till now, from the height of the great, uh, you know, dot-com bubble up till today, you'll find that this same group, the American people, pocketed none of this country's income growth at all. Their share in these great good times was zero. The upper 10% of the population, by which I mean the country's financiers and managers and professionals, took the whole thing. To be a young person in this country right now is to understand, I think, instinctively the downward slope that so many people are on these days. College costs are out of control, you know this. The university where I got my PhD back in the 80s and 90s, today costs nearly $65,000 a year to attend, okay? Four years of that is more than a quarter of a million dollars. You wanna to go to a school like that, you take out a lot of student loans, and as I been traveling this country for the last year, I have met many young people, you know, again and again and again, who are 50, 60, $100,000 in debt. And folks, they're starting out life this way. 
They're going out into this Uberized economy of ours with the equivalent of a mortgage and no house to show for it. Now, at the other end of the social ladder, of course, it's all upside all the time. Back in 1980, the CEOs in this country made about, on average, about 40 times as much as their blue collar line workers. Today, it's 373 times as much. One particularly lucky American family, in fact, has as much wealth as does 40% of the rest of us put together. The main accomplishment of the six high achieving individuals who make up this family, their main accomplishment was to inherit shares in Walmart, the retailer that has sucked the life out of thousands of towns in the part of this country that I come from. And that's where we are, folks. Nearly 10 years after the financial crisis, growth that doesn't grow and prosperity that doesn't prosper. This country, people now understand, is simply no longer arranged in such a way as to make its citizens economically secure. And that's the country that elected Donald Trump president. What I'm trying to say, folks, is that the middle class is disintegrating in the great middle class nation. And you know this is true. There is outrage and there is fury around every corner. You scratch any surface and it comes pouring out. Now you would expect everything I just described, all of those shocking numbers, the situation that we're in, you would expect that this would lead to a revival of the left, a revival of left politics in this country. And the reason you would expect that is because that's what's happened in the past. That's what's happened at very similar times in history, in the, in the 1930s, in the 1890s. And yet here's the crazy thing. This is the thing that has fascinated me for my entire adult life, that the politics of this age of inequality have been dominated by right-wing revolts, one after another after another, that only accelerate the disintegration of the middle class. And it's, today it's Trump. But in truth, and depending on how you count it, this is the fifth conservative, successful conservative uprising to happen in my lifetime. So I was born in 1965. Nixon came along in 1968. Uh, the, what they called the New Right and Ronald Reagan in the late 70s. Uh, Newt Gingrich in the 1990s. George W. Bush a short while after that. Then the Tea Party movement. And now Trump. It just keeps chugging along. And to understand how crazy all of this is, I want to try to put this in high relief. And the way I want to do that is to remind you of what things looked like back in 2009. After the, um, the financial crisis had happened, the Great Recession was underway, and it seemed like the philosophy of free markets had really been discredited for good. It really felt like that in those days. Here we had deregulated Wall Street. We had bowed down and worshiped at the feet of Wall Street. We had put nice friendly Wall Street guys in charge of overseeing Wall Street. And here Wall Street went and poisoned the economy of the entire world with their mortgage-backed securities. And so 2009 seemed like I mean, it felt like, to me, a historical turning point. Here, the uh, George W. Bush administration had blundered into this whole series of disasters, the Iraq War, Hurricane Katrina, the Jack Abramoff scandal, and then economic catastrophe. And it felt like the last straw, like this had to be the end of something. And in wa the other Washington where I live, the wise men of the city, thought that they understand what was, understood what was, what was going on. They said the tectonic plates were shifting. Conservatism's long reign was finally at an end. What had begun with Nixon back in 68 and had gone on with Reagan and, and all those people I mentioned was finally now in 2009, it was done. The age of Reagan was over, one historian wrote. The liberal age of Obama was dawning. The pendulum had swung one way and now it was going to swing back the other. 
by a force all its own. We didn't have to do anything. That's just how history works. That's just gravity for you. Back in 2009, the pundits in the other Washington loved to talk about how the Republican Party was on what they called a political suicide mission. How its candidates had zero chance in the enlightened new America we were living in. The Republican Party, they said, was being sent to the dustbin of history. And the reason I bring all this up, you know why, of course, this is exactly the same thing they said last year. With commentator after commentator insisting that Donald Trump didn't have a chance, and that the Republicans had destroyed themselves by making him their candidate. But to stick with 2009, the Republican Party themselves weren't particularly interested in their own demise. They didn't really want to go to the dustbin of history. And they did, this is the crazy thing, they did exactly the opposite of what those pundits in Washington, D.C. kept telling them they had to do. They stepped on the gas instead of the brakes. Instead of moving to the center, as every pundit, well, that's how you get your pundit license in D.C., you understand the, the genius of the center, right? Everybody always, at all times and in all situations, the answer to every question is move to the center. And they didn't do that. The Republican Party didn't do that. They totally disregarded this advice. They purged their moderate faction. And they responded, and this is fascinating, folks, they responded to the failure of markets by becoming free market zealots. Do you remember this? Waving their copies of Ayn Rand in the air, you know, the Tea Party movement, all of this stuff. And then in 2010, this radicalized Republican Party scored its greatest victory in congressional elections in many decades. At the state level, they took some 600 seats away from the Democratic Party. They purged countless Republican moderates. In 2014, they went on to conquer the Senate, and today the tragedy is complete. They control Congress, the presidency. Trump immediately named a justice to the Supreme Court, and they control the most state legislatures they have since the 1920s. Folks, this is a wipeout for the Democratic Party, and also for those pundits who have so persistently taken Democratic victory for granted. And all of this, all of this has been going on while Wall Street loots the world, and while the middle class of this country falls to pieces. Um, some years ago, I wrote a book about the rise of populist conservatism in my home state of Kansas. And I had a phrase in that book uh, that I was proud of. I said, I said that out here in Kansas, the gravity of discontent pulls to the right and to the right and further to the right. The gravity of discontent. Okay? And when I wrote that, I meant, to, what I, I meant to say that what I was describing out there in Kansas was a kind of aberration. It's like, look at this crazy thing that is happening out here on the high plains. The gravity of discontent doesn't work like it used to do. Well, folks, that's how it works now everywhere you go in this country. Everywhere you go in the Western world, the gravity of discontent pulls to the right. And why is that? One reason, and let's stick with the Republicans here in our own country for the time being, although we'll talk about foreign countries later on. But one reason that, this, that it works like that now is because our Republican Party here in America is very comfortable with the traditional language of populism, by which I mean the, the language of class anger. They speak it naturally. It is second nature to them. It just comes to their lips automatically. And you know what I'm talking about. They rail against the elite and the rigged system and they complain about the Hollywood millionaires and the arrogant people that make our TV shows and the haughty professors who are indoctrinating our kids when we send them off to college. And they pretend to love what they call the real Americans who inhabit heartland places like where I grew up. And this is fascinating, folks. They deliberately mimic 
left-wing protest movements from days of yore. That's what the Tea Party movement was. They were deliberately pretending to, well, you know, pretending to be a 1930s social protest movement. Uh, Glenn Beck mimicked Martin Luther King's March on Washington back in 2010. In 2009, Paul Ryan, who was not yet Speaker of the House, um, he wrote an article in Forbes magazine that he entitled, Down With Big Business. This is Paul, Paul Ryan wrote that. And now here comes Donald Trump. I was at the Republican convention last July in Cleveland and they called him, when he came out on the stage, they called him America's blue collar billionaire. <laughs> Seriously. And he, this was sort of the high point for Trump, his, his speech at the Republican. The Re Republican convention was a debacle. It was a d complete disaster. They, you know, they hadn't rehearsed anything. All of their celebrities didn't show up. You know, it, was, it, was, it was a disaster. But Trump himself tried really hard. He clearly had put some effort into his speech and it was like his, the high point of his campaign. And in that speech, he pledged himself to the working class voters who were, had been left behind by the current recovery. This is what he said. I have visited the laid off factory workers and the communities crushed by our horrible and unfair trade deals. Now this next sentence is an exact echo of Franklin Roosevelt. These are the forgotten men and women of our country, Trump said. People who work hard but no longer have a voice. Then he went on and tried to reverse the sort of standard liberal criticism of conservatives as always being you know, pawns of the Koch brothers or something like that. He said, here's what he said, big business, elite media, and ma he tried to flip it, right? Say that in fact it's Hillary. Big business, elite media, and major donors are lining up behind the campaign of my opponent because they know she will keep our rigged system in place. The rigged system, remember, he stole that from Elizabeth Warren. This is everything here is theft. Well, it's like not theft, it's just this is what people do in politics, you know? They swipe phrases from each other. Anyhow, he goes on. They are throwing money at her, meaning Hillary, because they have total control over every single thing she does. She is their puppet and they pull the strings. Now, Donald Trump is a hypocrite. This is, in my opinion, a hypocrite and a vulgarian and a bigot, but when he said those things, the man connected emotionally. When he said the system is rigged, folks, he's right about that. When he pointed out that huge parts of this country have been de-industrialized and that's a terrible thing, he's right. What drives me crazy is that those are things that my side used to say. Those are things that my people used to say. So where are the Democrats in all of this? You know this, folks, once upon a time, protecting the middle class society was the primary mission of the Democratic Party. That's who they were. And Democratic, I mean, they would never stop talking about it. You know, we're about the middle class. We're about protecting the middle class. That's who they were. And Democratic leaders of the past, I think if you put them in our current day situation, they would have known exactly what to do about it. You take someone like Franklin Roosevelt or Harry Truman or Lyndon Johnson or Hubert Humphrey, these guys would have taken one look at what Wall Street is doing to the world and they would have swung directly into action. Many of our modern democratic leaders falter, however. They understand, you know, mentally, that inequality is a terrible thing. It's an awful thing and they cry big hot tears about it. But they cannot find the conviction or the imagination to do what is necessary to put this thing into reverse. And instead they offer us the same high-minded policy platitudes that they have been dishing up since the 1980s. They tell us, oh dude, there's nothing anybody can do about technology, right? Nothing you can do about that. There's nothing anybody can do about globalization, right? Globalization, that is the, the invisible hand of God Almighty reaching down from the heavens to reorganize human affairs just however he sees fit. 
globalization. Nothing you can do about that. And so they promise us instead, you know, you know what they promise, it's always the same thing. Charter schools, more job training. Yes, they'll shovel out the student loans. But other than that, folks, they got nothing. The example of their failure that I want to focus on tonight also comes from 2009. And I keep going back to this year because for me, this was the turning point. The same year when the Republicans were telling us that the Republican Party was dead. And the issue I wanted to talk about is the issue of the Wall Street bailouts. What to do about Wall Street, which was the great question of 2009. And if you ask me, the great question of this century that we're living in. This was the turning point. This was the historical inflection point where the, this, this country and the entire world could have easily changed course, but our leaders chose not to, okay? Folks, we came to the turning point in 2009 and we missed the turn. I want you to remember what it was like. Barack Obama had been elected president in a massive wave of hope and enthusiasm, and I was one of the hopeful ones. And he had the entire country, or most of the country anyways, at his back, an overwhelming majority. He had the world behind him. And then he proceeded to continue the Wall Street policies of George W. Bush, essentially unchanged. No big banks got put into receivership. Now, I don't know about Seattle, but in Kansas City, we put banks out of business all the time. Small banks and medium-sized banks, it's a common procedure. Okay, but for whatever reason, it could not be applied to Citibank. Okay, no big banks got put into receivership. No bailouts got unwound. No elite bankers got prosecuted. Hell, they didn't even get fired. Obama did fire the CEO of General Motors. He had no problem doing that. But not the guys at, uh, you know, Wells Fargo. No, 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 not the guys at Goldman. Of course not. So what I'm saying is that Obama and his team, the Democratic Party, refused to change course when every sign was telling them it was time to turn, when it would have been healthy for the country to turn, good for the country's economy to make that turn, when it was fully within their power to turn. It's not anymore, but it was at the time, thanks to the bailouts. When it would have been overwhelmingly popular to turn. I mean, had Barack Obama gotten tough with some of these guys, he would still be president today. We would have amended the Constitution to keep him in there. And lastly, when the country fully expected our government to make this turn. And when I say our, the country fully expected them to make the turn, the Wall Street bankers themselves expected this to happen. You remember the famous meeting that they had with Barack Obama almost exactly eight years ago to the day? It was in March of, of 2009, and he called them all down to the White House, the leaders of the big investment banks. And they go into the meeting and they're ashen-faced because they know what's going to happen to them. They know what he's going to do. They're going to meet the new Franklin Roosevelt and he is going to take them to the woodshed. And they come out of the meeting a couple hours later and they're all smiles. Because what we did for them, folks, is we foamed the runways for them, in the immortal phrase of Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. We foamed the runways for the banks. Why? Look, let's get one thing out of the way right away. Barack Obama didn't play this greatest issue of them all the way he did because the working class rose up to defend Wall Street. That is not what happened. He didn't play it the way he did because the presidency lacks sufficient power. The presidency is an enormously powerful office, as we are reminded every day these days when we wake up in the morning and open the newspaper and see what outrage Donald Trump has committed overnight. Folks, Barack Obama played this issue the way he did back in 2009 because that's how he wanted to play it. And we have to get our heads around that if we want to understand what has gone wrong with the Democratic Party. But in truth, saying that only pushes the problem back a little bit. Because this doesn't, this, you know, why, does he, why did he want to play it that way? And this, folks, does not start with Barack Obama. If we want to understand why he chose to act the way he did in 2009, we have to go back to the 1970s, to the 1980s, to the 1990s. And back in those days, 
You might remember the Democratic Party was engaged in this very long-running civil war over who they were and what they stood for. And you had all these different factions in the Democratic Party back then, fighting, you know, like cats and dogs with one another, but they all came together on one thing. They all agreed on what they fought over everything else, but they agreed on this one thing, and that was that the Democrats had to turn away from the legacy of the New Deal with its fixation on working class people, okay? And what Democrats had to embrace instead, they said, was the emerging post-industrial economy and the people that the Democratic Party needed to identify itself with were, and this is, this is important now, the people that the Democratic Party needed to identify with were the winners in this new economic order, the highly educated professionals who populate our innovative knowledge industries. And what do I mean by professionals? We all know the traditional professions are lawyers, doctors, clergy, architects, people like that. These days, though, it's a m much broader category. It's an enormous group of workers, basically everyone with an advanced degree. So I'm one. Uh, the math PhDs who write derivative securities on Wall Street are professionals. The biochemists who make prescription drugs, <clears throat> also professionals. Now, as a group, this category of workers, these affluent, uh, highly educated white collar people, in the 1950s, as a group, they, they were one of the most Republican demographic groups in, in America. By the 1990s, they had completely changed sides and were one of the most democratic groups. And that's basically who the, Democrats, who, who, the, who the Democrats are these days. They have gone with this group. So what I'm saying here is that the Democrats, the, the way to think about them is as a class party in the sort of 19th century sense. They are a political party of a particular class. It's just not the working class. It's, they're the party of highly educated professionals. Now, we all know that the Democrats have many other constituent groups, of course, minorities, women, and the young, to name just a few. But professionals are always the ones who come first. Uh, you know, they're the ones who sit in the front seat with their hands fully on the steering wheel, and the rest of us ride in back. And it's the tastes and manners of professionalism that are always celebrated by liberal newspapers. And, and uh, you know what I'm talking about here, folks. You know, always stories about their favorite TV shows, um, artisanal cupcakes, <laughs> craft cocktails, which I'm gonna enjoy some of later uh, when this is all over with, you know. It's always that same kind of thing. So what I'm saying is that American liberalism started in the 19th century as a populist movement. But today, it is kind of the opposite of that. It's a movement of winners and the highly credentialed. Now, the uh, Democrats have developed all of these flattering phrases for their favorite demographic group, this group that they love above all others. Um, they call these high-achieving professionals the wired workers who will inherit the future. They're supposed to be a learning class that truly gets the power of education. There's, here's one you've heard. They are a creative class. Are you familiar with this one? The creative class. We hear this all the time nowadays. Do you ever stop and think about that? The idea that creativity is the property of a class. And that in order to please this class, we have to reorganize the map of the city. We have to set up like, you know, uh, art zones and this kind of thing. Hell, we have to write trade deals to make this class happy. Otherwise, they'll all be like move to Germany or something like that. We have to bow down before the creative class. Anyhow, here's the thing. Democratic leaders are themselves always drawn or almost always drawn exclusively from the ranks of this same group, okay? Think about the life stories of Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. They all have this very similar trajectory where they're all plucked from these lives of obscurity by fancy schools. Bill Clinton was this teenager in Hot Springs, Arkansas, right? Like he was in the school band and this kind of thing. And he, he goes to Georgetown. It's a university in the other Washington, by the way. He, he becomes a Rhodes Scholar. 
He goes to Yale Law School and the, 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 do, the gates of the world just sort of open, swing open for him. And with Barack Obama and Hillary, it's exactly the same kind of story. And if you look at their cabinet choices, it's the same, exact same kind of people. You know, always, not just highly educated, but always from a very small number of institutions. The Washington Post used to periodically run these stories marveling at Barack Obama's cabinet and the assembled, I don't want to say brain power, it's, it's credential power you know, that was in his cabinet. All these guys from Harvard, like every single one of them. Okay, not every single one, there were some from Oxford too. But, but, but there's, you know, it's, it's, it, it was extraordinary. This very limited set of, you know, but these are the people at the very top of their profession. Okay, so let me summarize the idea for you. What I think is the guiding idea of the Democratic Party and what makes them, so, everything about them so frustrating. It is that professionals are a kind of magical class in fact, they are the heroes of history. You might remember in Karl Marx, it was supposed to be the proletariat that stands at the end of history. They're the winners, you know, at the end of this long dialectic. Well, for Democrats, it's the creative class. That's who stands at the end of the great dialectic of creativity and innovation. They also happen to be the number one constituency of the Democratic Party. And the leaders of the party are almost always drawn from the same group. So you see what I'm getting at here, folks. It is a shift. What I'm describing is a long-term shift of allegiance from the traditional working and middle class to professionals. And this is what explains everything that is so massively frustrating about our modern-day Democrats. I mean, how do you get into a situation like the one we're in now, where inequality is growing, inequality is out of control? I mean, we are headed back to a 19th century pattern of wealth distribution. I mean, we're there, folks. We are back in the 19th century, essentially, in, 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 in terms of how the economy works, okay? And the party of the left, you know, can't do anything about it. They can't win elections, you know? Where the party of the left, you've got this incredible inequality that's growing out of control, and the party of the left is in a state of historic defeat where the middle class is disintegrating and people are turning to a mountebank like this man, Donald Trump. How is this possible? It's only possible, folks, when the party of the left isn't interested in its historic mission. That's the only way you get this combination of inequality and defeat. Why aren't they interested? Let's go back to that question of Obama and the Wall Street banks. The, what I still believe is the most important question of this stupid century that we're in. Why did the Democratic team fail to do what obviously needed to be done with the Wall Street banks? Why did they declare that Wall Street executives were going to be held to a different legal standard than ordinary criminals? And they did declare this. There's a high official at the Justice Department who said it. And he had to resign as soon as it became public knowledge, but he said it, folks. Why did this administration choose Wall Street over average Americans again and again and again? Why? Because for the achievement conscious people who filled the last administration, investment bankers were more than friends. These people are classmates in both senses of the word. They're peers. These people are the face in the mirror every morning, right? The two groups, you know, the Treasury Department and say JP Morgan, they are demographically identical. They are the same. You know, they all know each other. People go back and forth through the revolving door. There is no difference between these two things. Say people at the Justice Department, they look at Wall Street and they see an industry filled with people of subtle minds and extraordinary innovativeness and this sophisticated jargon, and God, they love that jargon. You know what I'm talking about? Wall Street has invented, contrived, this whole bogus jargon in order to shield themselves from outside scrutiny, you know? And the Democrats are like, dude, that is so sophisticated. <laughs> so they look at this industry and they see exactly the sort of creative individuals that Democratic Party theory tells us we must honor and respect, right? These financial wizards who are plucking wealth from thin air, right? They're making these financial instruments that are so admirably complex. 
it's like, dude, it's like financial rocket science, as one administration official said. And by the way, he said that as an, a way of explaining why they couldn't prosecute these guys. Dude, it's financial rocket science. No one understands it. Complexity. And folks, it is exactly the same attitude that they have towards big pharma. So innovative. You can't import generic pharmaceuticals from Canada or from India or something. Oh, no, 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 no. You have to protect these innovative companies. You have to protect Pfizer. And folks, mega dittos for Silicon Valley, an industry that can do virtually no wrong in democratic eyes. I mean, so lovable. Think of Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> so professional, so creative that for this one industry, enforcement of our country's antitrust laws was basically suspended just for this one industry. What does a party of the professional class believe in? Well, you know the most important item on the list, the only item that really matters is meritocracy. The, you know, faith that the successful deserve their rewards, and that the people on top in our society are up there because God damn it, they are the best. Okay, this is the first commandment of the professional class. Everyone gets what they deserve, and what they deserve is defined by how they did in school. Okay? So, you know, the only solution for inequality, if this is your attitude, the only real solution for inequality is for you to go to a really top rank college, right? They look at that farmer watching his way of life blow away in the wind out in Missouri or somewhere, and they're like, dude, you, you should have gone to MIT, you know? You say, you see what I'm getting at here though? This is not a philosophy for reducing inequality. This is a philosophy for rationalizing inequality. It is always your own fault. Whatever has happened to you, it is always your own fault because the way you screwed up back in elementary school or in high school, right? You didn't graduate. How many stories have you seen in the paper blaming you know, members of the working class for their own problems because they didn't go to college? How many of these have you seen? Hundreds, there's thousands of them. Or maybe they did go to college and they didn't go to the right college, they didn't go to a good school, right? They always fall back on that. And maybe they did go to a good school but they didn't study the right subject, they didn't study a STEM subject, right? They studied history like me. Or maybe, I mean, 20 years from now, they'll be saying, it's like, you fool, you studied STEM in college and everybody could see there was a glut of engineers. It doesn't matter, all of this is a way of rationalizing it, a way of pushing the blame for this enormous economic change back onto the individual. It's always your own fault. Folks, this is a philosophy of winners that I am describing. And the Democratic Party basically is today a party of winners. That is the left party in our system here in the United States, a party of new economy winners. I mean, there's a reason. You look at uh, poor Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, and it was all about her resume and her credentials, right? The most qualified candidate for president ever. By the way, I think that is act actually true. That's just not a great way to run for president, it turns out. <laughs> and she thought, you know, that that was the way to go by running as a hyper-competent expert, friends both with Wall Street bankers and the more enlightened sort of graduate student, you know? The, Democrat, the, the Democratic Party's unofficial slogan in this last go-round was, America is already great. I mean, it's like something you'd see inscribed on a country club logo. It's, a, it's not just complacency, folks. It's a sort of militant complacency. It's complacency on wheels. And it's no surprise that Hillary then did very well with affluent suburban Republicans, and she did really well in prosperous college towns. You look at the map of Missouri or of uh, Iowa or any of these she does, she wins the cities and she wins the college town, and it is a wipeout everywhere else. Now this is, what, what is truly fascinating about this is that it's happening not just here in America, this is happening all over the world. Everywhere you go, Parties of the left are dispirited. They don't know what they believe in anymore. And they spin the same fantasies that I've been describing, these fantasies of globalization and innovation and the creative class. This is everywhere you go. 
And everywhere you go, working people are abandoning these parties by the millions. And they are lining up with demagogues like Marine Le Pen and Donald Trump, who at least pretend to understand the situation that they're in. As for this man, Trump, I think he will make in some ways a perfect epitaph for our modern era of professional class liberalism. He is exactly the opposite of everything I've been describing. He lacks experience, government experience, completely. He had zero. He holds expertise in contempt. He is noticeably indifferent to facts. Remember how I was talking about the pundits are all, all in love with consensus and bipartisanship and moving to the center? What do you think Trump thinks about that? He doesn't care. He doesn't give a damn what the pundits think. This man is a human middle finger to the... <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to everything that makes up the sort of vision of the, the DC vision of the presidency. And what is our response to the age of Trump? Now I know, it, look, it is fun to enlist in the political wars. I know, I've, I've done it, I've been there. And it is fun to speculate about what a stupid man Donald Trump is. By the way, every time I, I hear, and I think he, you know, my own feeling, he, he seems stupid to me, I've never met him, but every time I think about mocking him for that, I, I recall that back when Ronald Reagan was president, somebody put out, there was this book of stupid remarks that he had made, and you know, enormous whoppers and, and lies, and you know, remember his tall tales? And illustrated with photos of Reagan actually looking stupid. And folks, he kicked our ass. And then we did the same thing with George W. Bush. There were all these little books you could buy of quotations of Bush sounding stupid, illustrated with photographs of Bush looking stupid. And he beat us too. And now here comes Trump. I also think it's, it's probably going the wrong way to scold his clueless supporters and to imagine that the real party divide, the real partisan divide in this country is between a party of righteousness and a party of sin. I think that's a mistake or that it's, we're in some kind of titanic battle between enlightenment and ignorance. I don't think that's what it is. But I think that the right answer to this incredible reign of fake populism that has been going on for decades now, that the right answer to it is to give people the real deal. To show those Trump supporters out there that we care about them more than Trump does, that yes, the system is rigged, and Trump's one of the guys that rigged it. I'm from Kansas, folks, and I can't help but think that populism by itself is a very healthy thing. A suspicion of elites, a hostility towards arrogance, towards aristocracy. It's, that's who we are as a people. That is democracy. That's what it looks like. And it's not hard to figure out the kind of populist issues that the Democratic Party could come up with that would bring working people back into the fold. Think about it, re-industrialization looks pretty good these days. A lot of Bernie's issues look very good. Universal health care, free college, I'd go for that. How about enforcing antitrust laws in this country? How about making it easier to form a labor union in this country again? Look, none of these are, <laughs> thank you. Can, can I just say, None of these are radical issues. These are all, you know, straight out of the sort of Harry Truman playbook, you know? These are like, this is who the Democratic Party used to be. These are the same things that would, that would win elections for them, that would bring these lost voters back, and would stop the disintegration of the middle class society, would reverse inequality. You, you know, it's win-win. You know how long it took me to come up with those issues? I swear, 10 seconds. Really, it's the easiest thing in the world to come up with the issues that, are, that would win for the Democrats. That's not hard. It's not hard at all. The hard thing is making the Democrats commit to those things. They don't want to do it. They have resisted everything I just described. They have resisted this stuff for decades with every fiber in their being. And they continue to resist right down to this day, even after the debacle of last November. Folks, they are going to have to be dragged, kicking and screaming to victory. <laughs> and until the day that happens, we are going to bounce along in this country from government by one set of affluent people to government by a different set of affluent people. 
you know, your consensus-minded Clintonism deregulates the banks and then yields to George W. Bush authoritarianism, which deregulates the banks some more, self-destructs, and allows the consensus team another chance, which they inevitably fumble, and so on and so on. Where is this all going to end? Only when we, the people, come back for our party. Thank you very much. I have two reasonably short and related questions. One of them is, do, do you think that to some extent the state of the middle class and the, the relationship between the middle class and the Democratic Party today is actually the ultimate legacy of the middle class and the Democratic Party in our parents' generation. I was raised by a, by a union, uh, a labor plumber, construction plumber, drove 90 hours each way to work at Fort Dix when there was no work in New York. And he told me if I worked with my hands, he was going to disown me. Really? And most of my, yeah, a lot of, certainly the urban, yeah. ethnic, working class was raised to get out of the working class. Yeah. And I think that's what you see with Clinton, that's what you see with Obama, and they're not exactly urban or ethnic either in the same way. Um, isn't it the fulfillment of the wish of a lot of the drivers of the working class of the 30s to the 60s to get the next generation out of the working class and into the intellectual class. Yeah, oh, of that's course. A, sure, yeah. sure, sure. That's, uh, that's, you know, but this is every parent's aspiration is they want their kids to be uh, successful and be a you know, white-collar professional and all that, all that sort of thing. And, and look, I did it. I went down that road. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, had a lot of bumps in it, and I'm, I'm not complaining, but uh, uh, I'm not against that, of course. But there's an, an even bigger way in which the success of the New Deal... Uh, and the success of the great society and all that stuff. And, and it was a great success, let's never forget, by the way. And I, there's kids now who don't remember that period. And I say, you know, when I was a child in the 70s, um, you could have blue-collar people living next door to white-collar people, and what, you know, what mainly separated them were matters of taste. And, uh, you know, this guy would drive a Chevy and this guy would drive a Buick. But the, the difference in their incomes was just not that great. And that really happened this country, that really existed right here in America, but in some ways, yeah, the seeds, it sowed the seeds of its own destruction in all sorts of ways, and one of them that, that, that is uh, interesting to me is that people don't, um, they don't believe that it's possible for it to all come apart. People don't think that the program that sustains them, Social Security or Medicare or anything like that, they think that that is uh, off the table and that that's not negotiable and that that's never going away. And folks, I'm here to tell you, it's all on the table with these guys in Congress. Okay. Okay, so the, the close hanging off, and I'll make it quick. Okay. What do you do about automation? We have the case where, you know, coal plant leaves, coal plant comes back, Modern coal plant has 5% of Automation. the number of employees. Okay. Yeah, no, I get, I get the question. What do you do let me, let me, because this, this comes up a lot. Let me, yeah. just, let me just answer that. So there was a time when um, uh, we called automation, we called that progress. And excuse me, I meant steel plant. Steel plant, yeah, okay. No, it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we talked, I'm sorry, my wife is an economist. What's the, what's the term that I was going to use here? Um, um, when you, you know, the rate of, uh, come on, productivity. Okay. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Productivity growth. Right. Productivity growth was always considered a good thing. And as productivity growth went up, wages went up for all through the New Deal, Great Society, up until the, uh, I think until the, the 70s, that these two things went in tandem. They were one to one. Economists defined them as being equal to each other. So productivity growth, man, this was great. You know, we, this is something we've always celebrated in this country. And now we're in this situation where productivity grows and wages do not grow any longer. Now, unemployment is not a big problem. I mean, we have, uh, unemployment is remarkably low in America, but wages never grow. So I think that, I can't help but think that it is not a problem so much of automation per se, which in the past, this is a great thing. 
You know, you as a worker are producing 10 times more stuff than you did before, <laughs> you know? It's a wonderful thing. What the problem today is that workers don't have any power to demand anything from their bosses. They have zero power. And there's all sorts of different factors that have come together. This, uh, this is my next book, right? I could write a whole book about this, why <laughs> workers have no power anymore. But there's all sorts of things that have stripped that, come together to strip that power from them. Okay. My newsfeed is a little schizophrenic, so I have a hard time uh, getting a good sense of Strauss and how. And I was wondering, and their book, The Fourth Turning, which apparently Al Gore bought a copy for everybody in the Congress. Al Gore did? Apparently. Uh, the older interviews, that's what they talk about, but the new interviews talk about the fact that uh, it's Bannon, all Bannon loves it. <laughs> so I would love your take on okay, them okay. and the concept okay. and all that. All right. So uh, he's referring to, um, now I have not read The Fourth Turning, so there's uh, some theorists of generations and uh, they, you know, they write about that everything in America is a, is a matter of one generation succeeding another. And my, my feeling about this is that Americans have this tremendous aversion to talking about social class and so they invent other ways of trying to understand it, and one of them is generations. Uh, I mean, generations exist, obviously, and generations have formative experiences and all that, but to understand that as the, the motive force of history, I think, is misguided. Anyhow, their biggest fan these days <laughs> is Steve Bannon, you know, who was, until recently was Trump's, um, uh, you know, most important advisor. And this is, you know, this is interesting. Bannon made a movie, a documentary movie about the financial crisis. And he was in, you know, involved with the Tea Party movement and I happened to buy a copy of this, of his DVD. I used to go to all these Tea Party rallies, right? Because I would write about them. And I was at one in Richmond and I, and I, and I was ransacking my notes like, did I meet Bannon? Did, you know, what did he say, you know? And I couldn't find it, but I found the DVD that I, I got from, you know, somehow I got it, right? And I watched it. And, and uh, so for the first 10 minutes or so, or 20 minutes even, it's like a legitimate documentary about the financial crisis. They interview legitimate experts and it has this sort of stock footage of, um, you know, skyscrapers in, in, in New York. You know, it looks a lot like another uh, documentary about the financial crisis, that one called Inside Job that you might have seen. So, but the first 20 minutes, it looks just like that and it sounds just like that and it came out at the same time, but then it does something really weird. He's like, well, how, you know, who are we going to blame this thing on? Now, this is fascinating, folks. You know who he blames it on? Hippies <laughs> in the 60s. And he just like, so he goes from this footage of, you know, like skyscrapers in New York and, you know, uh, uh, politicians signing bills or whatever to like people dancing at Woodstock. Seriously. That's his explanation, and he makes no effort to try to like prove that there were hippies in charge of you know the the the, the, the mortgage lenders, or that there were, or that hippies were buying the houses, or that hippies were running Goldman Sachs. He doesn't makes no effort to prove any of it. It's just the, the hippies learned bad values in the '60s, and now we see those bad values in full flower. The one must cause the other, and. Uh, he is sitting at the right hand of the president, the man who, the man who thinks this. It's, it is a truly staggering. The funny thing is, as I watched it, you know, I could make a similar argument. I've written about the 60s and the, that generation and all that sort of thing all my life. And uh, the way you make that argument is you say, um, Bill Clinton who was, uh, you, you read biographies of Bill Clinton, they always say he's the great leader of the 60s generation. It's all overblown, I think it's nonsense, but they say that. Bill Clinton becomes president and what does he do? He deregulates Wall Street. But Bannon doesn't want to blame deregulation, right? He can't do that. <laughs> so it's just all about their values. It's all this free-floating crap. And I finally figured out the genius of it though. You know what it is? He's bringing together the culture wars with the financial crisis, with the economic complaint. The culture wars were all about like blaming everything on the 60s. Everything that happens is, remember Newt Gingrich used to do this all the time. And he's bringing that together with the economic complaint of the Tea Party movement. And so in that sort of strategic sense, there's something brilliant about this. Uh, it's, it, it, as, as, as an actual documentary that's supposed to persuade you of something, it's a complete flat you know, failure. But anyhow, you, you asked me something, you knew I was gonna talk about that. I'm sorry, I blabbed too much. Yes, sir. Sir, as I recall, in 2009, 
the outgoing Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, and the incoming Treasury Secretary, Tim Geiner, both said that these banks are too big to fail. Yep. So we need a $780 billion to bail them out. In fact, the left-wing Nobel Prize economist, Paul Krugman, said that the bailout ought to be $1.3 billion. $1.3 trillion. So they say that's to prevent a second great repression, mm -hmm. depression. So are they all wrong? Are they, were they wrong? Yeah, right. No, they, they, weren't, they weren't wrong. But they, the, the thing is that bailing them out where everybody gets 100 cents on the dollar, you know, you know this is the famous thing with AIG where, uh, you know, all their counterparties and all this sort of thing. Bailing them, all these banks out, so that everybody gets their bonuses and everything is good and status quo ante, everything is, is great for these guys, um, is not the only option. Okay. There's all sorts of ways to put these banks out of business um, you know, and make sure it never happens again. I mean, when you say something is too big to fail, that automatically means you have to do something about it. Right. You know, you, yes, you bail them out at the time and you, there's all sorts of ways of making sure that the economy does not collapse. And they did that, but they went much, much, much further. The thing is that there's all sorts of steps that you take between zero, you know, doing nothing, by the way, which is what the Republicans in Congress wanted to do, <laughs> which would have been absolutely disastrous. But there's all sorts of steps between zero and 100% everybody gets paid, you know, and the public just eats it, right? There's all sorts of steps. And uh, Obama didn't take any of them. He just went immediately to, I, I don't think, look, uh, I don't want to pick on Barack Obama. I think he was poorly advised. Okay, so you are not saying Obama shouldn't have, have bailed them out. Not the way he did. Look, we've had, this is another thing nobody realizes. There's precedence for bailouts in this country. There's different ways to do it. Just giving these guys money, that's one way. <laughs> There's other ways. Roosevelt had a bailout agency. It was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Okay. When they bailed out the banks, they fired the top management. If the bailout agency looked at the bank's records and said, we don't, you're obviously committing fraud. There's like all kinds of uh, funny stuff going on here. You are all gone. Sometimes Roosevelt's bailout agency would say, we don't like your bank so much. We're putting it out of business and we're starting a new one over here with completely different management. This actually happened in this country, the home of free market capitalism. Fact, and there's, happened, but there's other examples. In fact, that happened at GM. Right. So it happened with GM. Yes, it did. That's right. And I think, by the way, that was a much more successful bailout. Another model uh, is in the 80s, the savings and loan uh, debacle. And yeah, we bailed those guys out, but a lot of bankers went to jail. And we, we didn't just say, okay, here's the money. See ya. <laughs> Forget about it. There has to be accountability for these people. Uh, but no, we didn't follow any of those, uh, uh, any of those uh, earlier models. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, great talk. So... I'm curious about the, you talk about uh, FDR, and I guess when I think about FDR as a, as a person, I see him also as being somebody who was very wealthy, who went to great schools, got a really great education, knew all of the, you know, saw all of these very wealthy people as his peers, and yet, when he became president, he chose to do things differently. Yes. And I'm just That's curious, exactly right. yes. I mean, just because Obama might see all of these people as his peers, or same thing with Bill Clinton, why didn't they why, just why choose they, why to they do something differently? differently? Yeah. Why, yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the, by the way, that's one of the sort of uh, questions, I hope you all read Listen Liberal, but this is one of the questions that I try to address in the book is because, so the, I was, as I mentioned, very enthusiastic about Barack Obama when he became president. I had been a graduate student at the University of Chicago when he was a professor there, and I had met him. And uh, he was our state senator in the neighborhood that I lived in, and we all admired him, all the Hyde Park liberals. We thought he was a great man. And when he became president, I was overjoyed. I said, you know, you look at the Bush administration, the hacks and the cronies and the fools and the dunces running everything, and here comes Barack Obama, and he's gonna put smart people in charge. We know that about him. You know, we, you know, we don't know these other things, but we know he's going to do that. Put smart people in charge, and they're going to show you how government should be run. And I was, I was excited about this. And then everything that we just described proceeded to happen. <laughs> you know? And it was a huge disappointment and disillusionment for me. And I started to question the whole idea of government by expert. 
you know, uh, maybe that's not such a great idea. And there's another book, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this book, The Best and the Brightest, about uh, uh, the Vietnam War and how the Kennedy and Johnson administrations put all of these experts from, it's the same schools, Harvard, a lot of the same departments, in charge of foreign policy, and guess what? They dream up this thing, the Vietnam War. They will not listen to outsiders criticizing it, and, they're, uh, and it's disaster, it's, it's catastrophe, and it's, he lays it, Hal, Halberstam, the author of that book, lays it directly at the feet of these people's professional expertise and their unwillingness to listen to outsiders. And so then I'm really depressed, right? So then I've got two really bad examples. And so I say to myself, well, has there ever been a time when government by expert worked? And the answer, of course, is yes, and it's the Roosevelt administration, the brain trust. And so you start, you know, these are guys, Roosevelt surrounded himself with brilliant people. It was one of the first times this was ever tried. He used all sorts of, of uh, brilliant people instead of politicians to advise him, and it was successful. And they pulled this country out of the depression, and they won World War II. So but you start comparing Roosevelt's team to Obama's team, and you notice the difference instantly. Roosevelt's people were not all Harvard guys. They were not the chairman of the, remember Larry Summers, the president of Harvard. You know, always the chairman of the department, always the very top guy in the profession. Roosevelt didn't do that for a very simple reason. Expertise, economic expertise in particular, had been badly discredited by the 1929 crash. I mean, all these professors looked like fools. Roosevelt chooses people from all different walks of life. All of them were brilliant people, but they came from all over the country and they came from all different uh, job, all different occupations. They weren't all university professors. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Harry Truman did not go to college. Uh, Robert Jackson was Roosevelt's attorney general. Uh, he was the prosecutor at Nuremberg and he later became, was on the Supreme Court, was a lawyer with no law degree. I don't know how that, how that works, but <laughs> I guess he just passed the bar, I don't know. But, you, but you, you go right down the list, Harry Hopkins, his right-hand man during the war, was a social worker, the man who ran the WPA, social worker from Iowa. Henry Wallace, the greatest ag secretary we've ever had in this country, ran a magazine for farmers. The man that ran Roosevelt's um, Federal Reserve, Mariner Eccles was his name, was a, a genius. He invented Keynesianism without having read Keynes. He invented an American version of this, and that's where all the deficit spending came from. He was a small town banker from Utah. The guy that I referred to earlier who ran the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was firing bankers all over America, was a banker from Houston, Texas. You know, none of these people, he did have some, he did have an Ivy League contingent, but even these guys were, unusual people. John K. Galbraith, right, who spent his entire life fighting against conventional wisdom. Or Thurman Arnold, who ran the antitrust division at the Justice Department, who was, <laughs> he had been a professor at Yale, but he'd actually, he'd also written a book called The Folklore of Capitalism. It's actually fun, you should go and read it sometime, but it's not the kind of thing that you would, <laughs> you know, that would get you tenure nowadays. <laughs> Anyhow, all I'm saying is that there are many sources of expertise in this country, and Roosevelt chose people from outside the mainstream. Had he gone with completely orthodox e economists, he would have, the same thing would have happened to him as what happened to Barack Obama. And you look at Obama, and that's exactly what he, what he did. He chose, the, he chose orthodoxy. And so in some ways, what I'm talking about is the curse of orthodoxy, that these people at the top of the profession will not listen to outsiders, they will not listen to people below themselves, they see the bankers as their peers, and there's this kind of class solidarity between them and the other people running American society, and they have none of the sort of solidarity that, or none of the, 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 none of the broader solidarity that Roosevelt's people had. It's a complete night and day difference. I don't know if I've made any sense here, but... We just have time for these last four questions. Over. Oh, okay. Last four. Okay. I'm, I um, do talk too much, and I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Um, based on your previous books, I read Listen Liberal when it first came out, cover to cover, and uh, it is just so well reported, so meticulously researched, 32 dense pages of footnotes, and I want to say that I think it's a very brave book. I want to thank you for that. Um, well, that's kind of you. You... Yes. you you are willing to call to account my own party that I have been very worried is just 
not as progressive as I certainly have wanted it to be. And you really, um, you really brought that to a lot more people's attention. So thank you. My quick question is, it's a little unfair because it's, it, it, it's, it's about a possible solution and I okay. really like your feedback. Um, and that is to try to de-emphasize and reduce the careerism that we find among elected politicians. It used to be decades ago that it was more the party that was in charge. And now a lot of the electeds are individual actors. They're, they're islands under themselves. So I was wondering if we reduced uh, terms, they, we lengthened the term of office, but we just let them serve one term. They wouldn't have to raise money after they were first elected. Yeah. And we would get not a bad people idea. who I mean, were not careerists. I yeah. just was wondering. Term limits, right? Yeah. It was very I'm popular one time. I, I was never, term limits is a, you know, for a lot of people that they think that that is a really good structural solution. I've never really thought about it that much. It's never been a, uh, a, a big you know, thing for me, but I think in this age of, we have to do something. There has to be some structural change. The money in politics is out of control. And Trump just got that. That's not going away anytime soon. Something has to change. A another change that I would like to see happen um, is uh, make it easier to, uh, I mean, this is never going to happen either. It's completely pie in the sky. But we ought to have third parties in this country again. You know, the... the <laughs> The, 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 so I'm, I mentioned I'm from Kansas. My favorite political movement of all time was called populism. It was in late 19th century third party movement. It was the last third party movement we ever saw in this country that tried to build from the ground up and was successful. And had, they had uh, mayors, governors, senators, members of Congress. And they did run a guy for president as kind of an afterthought. Today, when we talk about third parties, it's usually just a guy, you know, Ross Perot running for president or something like that and, you know, nothing else. And the reason that we've never seen another repeat of that is because as soon as populism died down, the Republicans and Democrats came together all over America and passed laws against, well, the strategies that the populists used. It's, it's complicated here, but they made it, basically made it impossible to uh, build a, th a real third party anymore. And that's not healthy. I mean, because as any, um, you know, anybody that studied game theory can tell you it's very easy to get in a situation with a two-party system where the parties are locked in and they, they know that they can't be challenged from outside for them to just strike a deal with each other and all sorts of issues are just completely off the table. Uh, you know, for example, uh, the trade, uh, trade deals up until Trump. I mean, this is one of the really interesting things that makes you think tra maybe Trump isn't such a fool that the Democrats and the Republicans had basically agreed to never debate trade. There's this complete consensus on it, airtight in Washington, D.C. And here comes this guy and he blows it all apart. Anyhow, that's, that's neither here nor there. But there's a bunch of structural changes that, that, I, would, that uh, I would love to see happen that I think would really change things. Over here. So just a couple weeks ago, uh, Frank Rich had a column in New York Magazine pointing out that uh, the Democrats only lost the presidency or the Electoral College by 72,000 votes in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Do you think the narrowness of that loss will keep the Democrats from rethinking what they should be doing? And where do Bernie Sanders and, um, uh, Liz, thank you, uh, <laughs> our yeah, senator, so, from, uh, yeah, I mean, senator well, from the North figure into what will happen next? Well, it's, uh, look, it's absolutely true that all those, um, the, the swing states that uh, Trump won, he won by very narrow margins. Uh, and, and Hillary got more popular votes. If you ask me, by rights, she should be president right now. I mean, she, more people voted for, you know, it's a democracy, more people voted for her than voted for him. However, having said that, there has to be accountability within the Democratic Party. There has to be. And they are brushing that any, any, any criticism of themselves off with, by pointing to things like that, which are, of course, true facts, um, and also by blaming the Russians. Have you guys heard this? This is every, everywhere now, everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's like that's, they've convinced themselves that that's what cost them the election. But I'm here to tell you that it's, well, you heard what I, I'm here to tell you. you. You heard the whole talk. But <laughs> this has been going on for decades. This is a long, slow progress. Another thing I often say to, to uh, young people, and they can't believe it's true. When I was young, Democrats controlled Congress Always, always, from the 30s up to the 1990s, always. 
Why? Because they were the party of the people. They had this incredible brand identity and they gave that up to become this other thing, the thing that I described tonight, and it has ended in this slow rolling disaster that gets a little bit worse every couple of years. Now, another source, or another reason why I wrote this book is because the Democrats are in, I, I live in Washington, the other Washington, I spend a lot of time with these guys. They're not anymore, but I used to. They're utterly complacent. They have this whole theory they call the um, coalition of the ascendant meaning, well, you know what it means, that the um, demographics of the country are changing, Democrats, Democratic voters are increasing in number and Republican voters are decreasing in number, therefore, Democrats have, don't have to do anything different. They can just sit around and eventually they will win without changing anything. People vote their demographics. That's the, that's, you can't persuade people. People are unpersuadable. They vote their demographics and the demographic numbers are in our favor. Therefore, we don't have to do anything. And they are sticking with this philosophy. And I wanted to shake them out of that. You know, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to break them loose from that. It can't be done. Can I just say, maybe what I said to you tonight makes sense. I hope it does. What I wrote in Listen Liberal makes sense. It is, I am not invited to any of the Democrats' postmortems. They are not taking any of this into consideration. I am not on NPR. I used to be on MSNBC all the time uh, back in the old days. Not anymore. This, none of what I told you is permissible within the Democratic Party. This, this, this larger historic critique. Instead, it's all about the Russians. Um, it's all about uh, Comey. I, by the way, I think that was a big factor, you know. But basically, yeah, I mean, it, elections in this country are close and the Democrats fumbled. But you know, we don't need to go into all that, it, unless somebody wants me to, but I need to shut up is what needs to happen, yeah. Well, when I, when I look back at the election, I think of this phrase from a punk song, and the phrase was, I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. I want to destroy the past, and, sir, bye. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I think there's a danger in calling Trump stupid, his supporters stupid, because it's going to turn those people off. Like, yeah. do, you, do you see that danger? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, these, are, these are people that, that were, uh, not all of them, of course, but many of them are former Democrats. These are, by definition, winnable votes. Absolutely, and, and to, to call them stupid. By the way, that is what the, that's another part of what the, the Democrats are doing. And I don't mean that it's not the Democratic Party, but this is all the pundits in D.C. and New York. I mean, you're talking about New York Magazine a, a second ago. The idea of like denouncing you know, Midwesterners from New York Magazine. It's like, what the hell planet are you on? You think that's going to be helpful? You think that's a good idea that's going to make you love them love you? You know, <laughs> it's crazy. But there, uh, this is um, this is this is what the, the, the Democrats are so angry right now, and they feel like this has been stolen from them, and they do not want to hear any kind of criticism. I'll give you one example. I wrote a story about uh, uh, rural Missouri. Uh, Trump won in rural Missouri big time. Um, like some of these counties, eighty percent. You know, crazy. And these are places that not too long ago were not just democratic, but profoundly democratic. Like, this is Harry Truman country. I was out there talking to people, I was in this woman's house and she had a shrine to Truman in her living room. These are people that love, that used to be, loved the Democratic Party, Dick Gephardt, Stuart Symington, you know, Missouri Democrats. And um, now it's Trump out there. And, you know, and, and these, it's, they didn't go Republican because they got rich. It's the opposite. This is small town America. If you don't have a hospital or a prison or a school, a university in your town, you're gone. These towns are, I don't know about Washington State, but in, in rural Missouri, all over the Midwest, Iowa, Wisconsin, if you don't have one of those things, you are finished and your town is crumbling. And I mean physically falling to pieces. And these people are desperate. And they voted for, a lot of them went for Obama uh, in 08. You look at the rural, rural counties in Iowa, he, Obama did very well there but now it's Trump country in this huge way. What's the Democrats' response to that? This is, this is catastrophe, right? What's the response? How are they gonna win those people back? Their, their answer is walk away. Save your money and compete in the big cities. You know, we have nothing to offer these people. We have no way of speaking to these people. They are lost to us. That is their official response to this debacle. 
It's idiotic. It's absolutely insane. Yes. I'll be quick because I know you want to wrap up. I'm just curious in building on the one of the questions before about complacency. Uh -huh. And to what extent, if any, do you think that the progressive movement that we saw with Bernie Sanders' campaign, with Elizabeth Warren's popularity, with the election of some folks to the House, like our, one of our local congresswomen, Pramila Jayapal, um, with the fact that Bernie and Tom Perez are now going on a national barnstorming tour to try yeah. and incite interest and enthusiasm. To what extent do you think that that wing or contingent of the party can actually exert meaningful influence in the next couple of election well, cycles? That's, 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 my, that's the big sign of hope, and that's a good note to end on. I'm very hopeful about uh, Bernie Sanders' influence in the party, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So I interviewed Bernie Sanders for Salon Magazine back in... 2000, was it 15? I, I don't remember anymore. It's a great, it's a good, good interview though. You should go back and read it. It's online, it's free, all that sort of thing. And I'm a big admirer of Bernie Sanders. I voted for him in the primary. And um, I was, uh, I wrote a story for Harper's Magazine about, about the uh, Washington Post's hatred for Bernie Sanders, in which I read every uh, editorial and op-ed they published about Sanders from January to June of 2016, and they were about five to one against Sanders. I mean, they were incredibly, incredibly hostile. I mean, the things they said about this guy were just unbelievable. And, uh, and today he is the most popular politician in America. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's a great thing, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a great thing, but that, there, that, those two facts give you, those are the parameters of the battle. That the Washington Post, and I was, by the way, I was watching the Sunday talk shows the other day, and they were, Bernie Sanders came up, and they were sneering at him again. They just, they hate this guy. You know, and what's funny is the public loves him. He's like this grandfatherly, he's, uh, he reminds you of Democrats from long ago, like a Harry Truman style Democrat. He's a great man, you know, and his ideas are not radical. Uh, and he, that accent of his, which I at first thought must be an incredible turnoff, actually is kind of reassuring, you know? It's something, from, something that you remember from long ago, you know? And uh, uh, the public loves this guy, but the people in D.C. absolutely hate him. And that's the battle, and that's going to be the battle for the next couple of years, is the Sanders faction, such as it is. I mean, he's not really in the Democratic Party, which is a part of the problem. But the Sanders faction of the Democratic Party versus the Clinton people. And this is going to play out in all sorts of different ways. But I think that's where the real, that's, if, if I'm hopeful about anything, it's that. And I'm going to end on one last note of hope, okay, in some ways, and, and I've been bad-mouthing Donald Trump tonight, so I want to say something nice about him. The, um, Donald Trump showed us a fascinating thing. Think about this, folks. One of the things that we were told back in the 1990s was that the Democrats had to abandon being the party of the New Deal and being the party of working class people and all those things I described. One of the reasons they had to do that is because you couldn't raise any money that way. And now in the great enlightened 1990s, we knew that if you wanted to beat the Republicans, you had to match them dollar for dollar in fundraising. And in order to do that, all of this stuff from the past, all of our liberalism and you know, labor and all that, that all had to go. And we had, the, the Democratic Party had to sell out its principles because then it could win. And so here's Hillary Clinton, and she does all those things, and damn, she raised money. She raised twice as much as Trump and lost. And that's, okay, you don't see the hope in that? <laughs> all the rules are gone. All the rules, everything that they've told us that we had to do to sell out and like that only money mattered, it doesn't matter, folks. All the rules are smashed. This guy, Trump, broke everything. You know, he destroyed two political dynasties, the Bushes and the Clintons, and he, and, he, and he showed that money is not the end of everything, that there are more than one, there's more than one, okay, I'm trying to be hopeful here, come on now, this is a great thing. <laughs> So thank you for coming and let's sign some books. I brought a pen. <laughs> <laughs>